by Professor Dr. Ahmed Dijon Angelos. Uh, 
studies, Turkish studies in Hungary, Irish Orientalists, James Clarice Mangan, and uh, classical Turkish uh, poetry. Coffee and Istanbul in Turkish culture. Last one. <laughs> yes, Dr. Anita Sengupta and Priya Singh by Sengupta and Priya Singh. Uh, Central Asian Studies in India and West Asian Studies in India. Also in this year, Masters and Doctoral students of Institute of Language and Literature in Kazakhstan Abai National University, Pedagogical University, visited our center within the framework of uh, a 10 day visit and they participated in the graduate courses in Turkish language division of Department of Turkish Language and Literature. Now third, third group, uh, now, and they are here. <laughs> uh, they are listening to us. Confession. It's an honor for us to become the welcome Dr. Anita Sengupta and Priya Singh from Meblana Ebu Kalamazad Institute of Asian Studies. I'd like to express our sincere thanks to our guests and we wish to uh, have a productive meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Welcome.
where long-term connections between the region and the Indian subcontinent was the focus of scholarship. And uh, a lot of historical studies are still conducted on the relationship between the South Asian and the Central Asian region. Uh, this, uh, for instance, looks at uh, the tradition of uh, uh, people who used to move from one region to the other, traders, for instance, but also uh, the uh, cultural exchange that was a constant between the two regions. There is research on this and contribution by researchers at the Aligarh Muslim University because much of this is based on um, uh, manuscript research and some documentation is available at the Gabaksh Library in Patna and also the Rampur Reza Library. A second tradition was linked to the activities of the Indian revolutionaries in the interwar period. Now, uh, during the two world wars, when India was also fighting for its own national independence, there were a group of revolutionaries who had traveled to these regions. Uh, and uh, there is a tradition of uh, studying their uh, activities and some of these perspectives have, and you know, they, they have written about their experiences of looking at these regions. And some of these are provided, for instance, by M. N. Roy or Abhuni Mukherjee, Rahul Sankitai, of course, was more concerned about the long-term history of the region. And he has very interesting studies about how uh, there is a continuous historical and cultural tradition from the South to the Central Asian region. After the formation of the School of International Studies in Delhi in 1956, these traditions of study were reinforced by scholars working on modern Central Asia based on acquaintance with the Russian language and the training given at the School of Languages at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. This actually laid the foundation of area studies in India as we know it today. After the formation of the independent uh, republics in the Central Asian region, there were various other units which were devoted to Central Asian studies, which developed, for instance, in GNU. Um, in the Eurasian Studies Center at the Mumbai University, the Area Studies Program in Srinagar University, the Central Asian Program at the Jamia Media University at the Academy of Third World Studies. Now, uh, I think I should very briefly tell you that when we study in uh, Eurasia and India, what do we mean by Eurasia? Because the term Eurasia itself is a very fluent term. A fluid term which is uh, used by different uh, scholars and by different parts of the world differently. Eurasia in India is presumed to com uh, comp uh, comprise of the Russian Federation, particularly Russia and Asia, the five Central Asian republics, Mongolia, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia to a certain extent, Inner Mongolia and Xinjiang. In India, of course, this domain has been largely defined by the state, which has stimulated academic enterprise, but also provided an umbrella for private commercial enterprise. The focus has been on the establishment of formal relations with the five republics of Central Asia and treating Russia and Asia and the territories of the People's Republic of uh, China as part of Moscow or Beijing-centered uh, policy, which means that Eurasia is not treated as one whole, uh, uh, uh, uh, you know, we treat uh, the Russian part of Asia and Xinjiang as part of Moscow or China-centric uh, uh, studies and uh, the Central Asian parts as a different uh, section of studies. Now the Indian focus, of course, the state uh, focus has been on the establishment of diplomatic relationship with these states. The projection of India's uh, long-term cultural connections, the idea of the region as an extended neighborhood, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, along with this, of course, there have been issues of energy security or strategic depth and finding interest and uh, support for India's military hardware requirements. As part of this, certain units devoted to the study of Eurasian region was established, both within Soviet study centers. Now, prior to the uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union, of course, all the centers that looked at this region were termed Soviet Studies Centers. Subsequently, of course, all of the, these have changed their names. For example, the center in JNU is now known as the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies. Uh, so they, they used to be part of the Soviet Studies Center. Uh, and uh, I think it is also as a part of uh, this effort that the Maulana Abul Kalam Azad Institute of Asian Studies was set up. Now, uh, there will be a brief film on our institute once we have finished speaking, but uh, uh, just to point out what our institute is all about, 
Uh, the institute was conceived in the centenary year of Maulana uh, Abul Kalam Azad's birth in 1989 to commemorate both the memory and the ideas of one of the most important freedom fighters of 20th century India. Azad was a revolutionary and a staunch supporter of India's composite culture, world peace, progress and a consistent believer in liberal democracy, scientific rationality and friendly relations with India's neighbours. It was with a vision to focus on India's Turko Persian heritage and India's linkages with these regions, something that Azad was passionate about. He himself was a Persian scholar, very well known Persian scholar, and he went on to become India's first education minister who shaped much of the education policy of our country. And in fact, um, I will hand over a couple of newsletters to Guljanat uh, in the evening. And if you look at them, there is a special issue on Azad where you know, he made visits to all of these countries with which he thought India should share a special relationship and he came to Turkey and there are photographs of him in Turkey meeting with the presidents and other diplomats. Uh, that uh, the institute was, uh, the, our institute started its operations from 1993. It was visualized as a body which could revitalize research in India in areas like, I said, the composite culture of our country. Most specifically, the institute was established with the objective of carrying out research with focus on social, cultural, economic, and political developments in Asia from about the middle of the 19th century, with special emphasis on their links with India and, of course, the lives and works of modern Azad. The institute began with an emphasis on specializing on modern and contemporary affairs in South Asia, Central Asia, and West Asia. It began with the idea of carrying out area studies in the five Central Asian republics of the former Soviet Union, but also Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. Of course, in recent years, we've broadened our area of research both into South and Southeast Asia and into various areas of West Asia. Priya will be talking in detail about our West Asian program. The Institute actually carried forward the traditional interest in the study of other regions of Asia that Kolkata invites. We are situated not in Delhi, but in Kolkata. This interest was primarily based on an interest in civilizational exchange and mutual learnings that had looked for new ways of learning about others. In the course of this, it had nurtured scholars like Aurukushat Shastri or Kalidash Nath, and the study of South Asia's links with Central and Northwest Asia are part of this cultural dialogue. Uh, you know, there always was a society called the uh, Society for the Study of Greater uh, in India, and uh, the culture, the study of cultural linkages between India and other parts, had always been a culture in Kolkata. So our institute actually was uh, established as part of that uh, effort. Um, now, the concept of area studies, as you all know, has two distinct connotations among scholars. The first is that it is sometimes used to refer to a more detailed description of a nation or region that does not seek to generalize beyond this specific case. The second can be used to refer to studies that build on deep and context-rich knowledge of a specific society or region to develop propositions of a more general applicability. Our institute accepted the second is useful and researchers today aim at cross-national generalizations with wider examination of issues such as economic cooperation, competition, environmental management, ethnic and religious conflict, gender issues, migrations and weapons proliferation. So all these are issues that are important across Asia and in fact globally. And our institute uh, attempts to study this on a cross-cultural uh, basis. Alongside this, and somewhat in reaction to the vogue of globalization, researchers have also turned to the study of forces that actually resist globalization, such as the rise of ethno-nationalism in various parts of Asia, but also the allure of local movements. Developing at the intersection of disciplines, area studies expanded upon the idea that cultural areas are enclosed within national territories, and that the understanding of these distinct areas continues to be crucial. It was in this tradition that the Institute chose a certain cultural areas and decided on a detailed study of the same. These were areas which were neighboring India, with which it shared deep affinity, both historical and contemporary. And of course, like I said, they included Afghanistan, Iran, Turkey, the five Central Asian republics. In all of these countries, there were vital traditions of Turku Iranian culture and even older folk religions, trading and cultural traditions that go back to at least two millennium or more. This focus has been, since then been ex uh, expanded to look at more contemporary issues. 
The objective was to con contribute to the understanding of ways in which the Asian regions transformed their internal turmoil and attained viable social, economic, as well as political structures uh, for uh, dealing with these uh, critical issues. Issues of the geopolitical notion of Asia, the intellectual history of Asian studies, decolonization in Asia, the economic restructuring of the continent, development in women studies, border and border related problems were all a part of this. Uh, and over the years, researchers have expanded their studies from that of individual states to that of larger regions. Now, one may question why does an understanding of Eurasia assume importance beyond the exploration of either the exotic, which is still the term in which uh, the region is actually defined, or even the repressive, which again, you know, the authoritarian states in Central Asia is the way we actually look at them. Uh, why does an understanding of the ways in which history is being rewritten in these forms, which is what uh, our institute attempts to do, or forms of representations debated within the Eurasian states become important, either for the academic or for the policy policymaker? We are an institute under the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, so part of our research is also aimed at uh, providing inputs for the government. So. Uh, you know, we, when we do our work, we have to come to an understanding of why what we are looking at is important both in terms of sheer academic research, but also in terms of what we contribute to uh, our country's uh, understanding of these regions. A simplistic explanation is offered in terms of a globalized and therefore interconnected world where at least in economic terms the, the discussion assumes importance. It cannot be denied that the Eurasian region is accepted as one where there are substantial reserves of uh, natural resources. And in the contemporary world, of course, this is, uh, of, this is of course becoming very, very important. There is also no question about the significance of what is now referred to as energy security and how to ensure it and how far uh, the region's security is uh, in some way connected to the South Asian um, uh, security and all of this is of course a very realistic discourse that reflects what is defined as a national interest in each of these states. But as distinguished from this discourse is one that focuses on a representational understanding of realities. Here, stereotypical images are re-examined and new discourse is offered. This addresses problems associated with uh, looking at the Eurasian paradigm that has resulted in renewed debates and discussions about a space which is imagined as the heartland. Now, all of you know that you know we look uh, uh, the Mekendarian description of the region as the heartland still continues to uh, um, overshadow much of the study, but uh, is tended to be uh, represented as a periphery. We call it the heartland of Asia, but in uh, you know in some way Central Asia still remains at the periphery of world politics. These, uh, there have been reappraisals about culture and identity that relate not only to the present but also recontextualize uh, the past. Similarly, the future has been re uh, envisaged through alliances and partnerships among regional and international players. There is also recognition for the new, uh, need for new methodological terminologies that take note of these alternative paradigms uh, within these present contexts. Uh, in certain ways, this is what our institute attempts to do. It attempts to look at all of these regions uh, in a somewhat different way than it has been viewed traditionally. The reference to the exotic, unfortunately, is not just restricted to definitions intended for the traveler. In fact, this reference is part of initiatives that are now underway to restore mercantile trade through the region. It is exemplified by the extensive use of the metaphor of the Silk Road that it runs across the region. This interconnected network of moves that connected China with the Mediterranean now dominates a number of academic and non-academic projects that have a wide range of objectives from tourist opportunities to revival of trade and even the search for alternative outlets for natural resources. The revival of cultural contacts is significant in this context. However, most references to the region uh, refer to it as a closed society. And, you know, this is where we hope to make a difference and look at the region from within itself in order to define it as a region that needs to be studied for itself. Uh, so, uh, you know, just let me uh, uh, underline the fact that uh, what we tend to do at the Institute is underline the fact that the region uh, not just provides strategic depth to India or is a source of natural energy, but is a region where we've had a very long cultural and historical uh, contact. 
and as such needs to be studied within a wider context where uh, uh, uh, engagement needs to happen on a more multilateral levels. Uh, now, um, uh, let me briefly tell you what we actually do at the institute. We are basically a research institute where our researchers work on various projects. Um, and one of the most significant problems of Asian studies, of course, is the fact that there are very few documentation centers on Asian studies in India. And the institute, uh, of course, is trying to do that. It is trying to build not just a documentation center on Azad and the national movement, but also a documentation center and a very rich library on Asian studies in general, uh, which would include not just secondary material and journals, but also primary materials in various regions of um, Asia. Uh, as a part of this, we organize international and national seminars on various uh, regions, but also on various themes throughout the year and we have contacts not just with the Eurasian and Central Asian parts of Asia but also the West Asian, the South Asian, we have uh, contacts with Chinese institutions and with institutions in other parts of Asia. We publish an annual journal which we call the Asia Annual and now um, as I just mentioned we also have a, a quarterly newsletter which we call Asia Connect that uh, looks at various uh, issues of concern in Asia. Um, one of the major things uh, that we also emphasize and uh, encourage is collaborative work with other institutes, not just in other parts of India, but also in other parts of Asia. And uh, it is as a part of this initiative that we are here today. Uh, we hope that uh, you know we've been able to give you uh, a, a little idea about what we do at the institute, how we look at uh, Asia and the Eurasian region, and what our institute uh, institute's activities are all about. Um, we would like to uh, encourage all of you to be part of our institute's activities. We would encourage uh, writings from you that we can publish in our journals. And of course, we would love it if all of you came to India at one point of time to be a part of our institute's activities. Thank you very much. Sovyetler Birliği çalışmaları merkezi olan kuruluşlar 
Artık Avrasya çalışmaları veya Antasya çalışmaları olarak değiştirilmiş. Hangi kurumlar var? Delhi'de bulunan Cavaharlan Niyer Üniversitesi var. Burada mesela Avrasya çalışmaları merkezi var. Onun dışında Rusya ve Ortasya çalışmaları merkezi var. Mumbai ya da Bombay, Mumbai Üniversitesi var. Şirnagar, Kaşmir'de bulunan Şirnagar Üniversitesi'nde yine Ortasya çalışmaları merkezi bulunmaktadır. Delhi'de bulunan Camiya Milliye İslamiye ile ilgili bir bir kurum, Yüksek Öğretim Kurumu. Üçüncü diğer diğer araştırma <gülüyor> üniversitesi var. Bunlar da dediğim gibi daha önce Sovyetler Birliği'ni araştırmaya yönelik olan kuruluşlar sonra da Avrasya, Orta Asya şeklinde araştırma kuruluşlarına dönüşmüştür. Hangi bölgelere bakıyorlar? Orta Asya'daki Beş Cumhuriyeti, Azerbaycan, Moğolistan, İç Moğolistan, Doğu Türkistan, biraz Ermenistan çalışmaları. Bunlar Avrasya diye düşündükleri, Avrasya'dan kastettikleri bu bölgeler. Bunun dışında Avrasya'dan ayrı olarak da e, Güney Asya, çünkü bu enstitü Asya çalışmaları olduğu için Orta Asya'da sınırlı değil veya e, Rusya Federasyonu içindeki Türkleri de, de sınırlı değil. Bunun dışında işte Güney Asya, Batı Asya, Batı Asya aslında bizim e, Türkiye'de kullandığımız tabirle yakın doğu, yakın doğuya onlar Batı Asya diyorlar. Orta Asya ayrı olarak Rusya Federasyonu içindeki Türklere bakıyor. Hangi konulara bakıyorlar? Enerji, güvenlik, e, eskiden dediğim gibi Sovyet çalışmalarında mevcut olan diğer konular şimdi bağımsız olarak yapılıyor. E, ondan başka e, sosyoekonomik, kültürel, uluslararası ilişkiler bütün bu konulara bakıyorlar. Aklınıza gelebilecek birçok anlamda mesela göç çalışmaları, kadınların durumu, etnik, çatışmalar, etnik, milliyetçilik, sosyal dönüşüm, küresel, bugünkü küreselleşme dünyasında meydana gelen önemli gördükleri bütün konuları çalışıyorlar. Mevlana Abul Kalamazat'la ilgili yine söylediği şöyle not aldım. Kendisi Hindistan bağımsızlığı için çalıştığı, çalışmalar yaptığı esnada Hindistan için önemli olacak bütün ülkeleri bizzat ziyaret etmiş. Bunlar için de Türkiye'de bulunmaktadır. Türkiye'ye geldiği sırada görüşmeleri bununla ilgili kayıtlar, fotoğraflar mevcutmuş. Bu enstitüden ayrıca çalışma amacı objektif olarak bu bölgeleri çalışmak dedik. Bu enstitü Kolkata'da bulunmaktadır. Ya da Kalkut'ta diyebildiğimiz Kolkata diye söylenen. Neden orada bulunuyor? Yani Delhi de değil de neden Kolkata'da diye düşünürsek bir e, büyük Hindistan e, düşüncesi vardır. Bu büyük Hindistan e, diye düşünüldüğü zaman yani diğer yan bölgelerle e, onların karşılıklı iletişimi anlamında düşünülür. Bu Hindistan'ı daha büyük ölçekte e, düşündüğümüz ettiğimiz, tasavvur ettiğimiz zaman Kolkata oranın merkezi olarak düşünülmüş. Onun için Kolkata'da bulunmaktadır. Bu arada adı geçen e, enstitü e, Kültür Bakanlığı'na bağlı olarak çalışmaktadır. Kültür Bakanlığı'na bağlı olduğu için dolayısıyla e, burada bulunan, burada çalışan araştırıcıların e, çalışmaları zaman zaman e, Kültür Bakanlığı'na veya hükümete de e, gidiyor. Niçin bunu yapıyorlar? Hükümeti bu bölgelere yönelik siyaset ya da dış siyasetini belirlemeli e, uzman görüşüne değer veriyorlar. Onların görüşleri doğrultusunda bu bölgelere yönelik siyasetleri şekillendiriyorlar. Ee, mesela az önce söylediği gibi Avrasya bölgesi olsun, Avrasya bölgesi içinde söylediği veya Hindistan komşuları, Afganistan, İran, Türkiye olsun, Beş, Orta Asya Cumhuriyeti olsun, bütün bu bölgelere yönelik dış siyasetine yönlendirirken bu değerli uzmanlarının görüşlerini dikkati kayda alıyoruz. Ee, bunun dışında tarihi yeniden yazmaya da çalışıyoruz. Ee, özellikle Avrasya bölgesi için diyor. Çünkü eskiden Az önce söylediğim gibi Sovyet bakış açısı açısından bakı yazıldıysa bakıldıysa bugün ise e, kendi objektif olarak kendileri bölgeye giderek bizzat araştırmalar birlikleri tarifi yeniden yazmaya çalışıyorlar. E, sınır konuları, sınırla ilgili e, konular, jeopolitik konular özellikle e, çok büyük önem teşkil etmektedir. Bundan başka bölgedeki güvenlik, yani eski stereotip basma kalı fikirlerden öte yeni paradigmaların oluşturmasına yönelik de çalışmalarda bulunmaktadır. Onun dışında hani bölgeyi Orta Asya çekeni Avrasya uzmanı olduğu için bu Avrasya bölgesi çalışmanın anlamı nedir diye düşünecek olursak dedi. 
Makkinlerin teorisi hala geçerlidir dedi. Kısaca e, açıklayayım. Makkinlerin kalpkâh teorisi dediğimiz e, daha 19. yüzyılda e, bir kalpkâh teorisi diye meşhur bir teorisi var. Eğer dünyaya hakim olmak istiyorsanız Avrasya bölgesine, Orta Asya'ya hakim olacaksınız diye. E, onun içinde de ben onu devam ettiriyorum bu konuşmadayım. Avrasya bölgesinde de hakim olmak istiyorsanız Fergana bölgesine dikkat edeceksiniz demişti. Makkinler ee, ve şu anda dediği gibi e, uzmanımızın görüşlerine diyorum. Makkinlerin bu kalpkâh teorisi hala geçerliğini korumaktadır diyor. Aha, zaman zaman baktığınız zaman Orta Asya yani biz bunun önemine inanıyoruz diyor ama zaman zaman baktığınız zaman e, Orta Asya dünya siyaseti açısına baktığınız zaman çok da merkezde olmadığını düşünebilirsiniz. Bazı uçta olduğunu da düşünebilirsiniz diyor. Ancak biz yine de bölgenin çalışılmaya değer olduğuna, çalışma açısında önemli olduğuna inanıyoruz diyor. Bölgenin çalışmaya değer, değmediğini anlamak için bölgeye gitmek lazım diyor. Ve biz bizzat hepimiz bölgeyi ziyaret ediyoruz. Ve hani neden şöyle düşünebilirsiniz, neden Hindistan Orta Asya'ya çalışıyor, Avrasya'ya çalışıyor diye. Şunu e, söylemek isterim diyor. Bizim için çok stratejik önemi olduğundan değil, bizim için yeraltı kaynakları zenginliğinden ötürü değil, biz çok eskiden beri, tarihten beri gelen, uzun süredir devam ede gelen kültürel iliş, ilişki ve iletişimizden dolayı Orta Asya bölgesinde çalışıyoruz dedi. Ve bu anlamda e, e, sizleri de hepinizi Hindistan'a beklediğini e, söyledi. Hepinizi orada görmek istediğini belirtti. Onun dışında e, Estü'nün e, Birkaç ayda bir defa çıkardığı bir dergisi mevcut. O dergiye yazılarınızı bekleriz. Onun dışında değişik e, işbirliğine açık olduğumuzu işbirliğine bir açık olduğu belirtti. Değişik konularda, araştırmalarda, projelerde, e, faaliyetlerde sizleri görmek isteriz dedi. Enstitü onun dışında yılda birkaç defa uluslararası ve ulusal konferanslar düzenlemektedir. Belki o konferanslara katılımımız anlamda sizlere oraya beklediğimi söyledim. Teşekkür ederim.
its evolution and uh, the various program that it deals with. Uh, so what I do is I actually concentrate only on the West Asia program, uh, the evolution of the West Asia program in the institute, its basic aims and objectives, and how we look at the way ahead. Uh, before I do that, you know, it is very important for me to point out that in uh, my part of the world, we look at the Middle East as West Asia, uh, a term that refers to the westernmost part of Asia, and the term is partly coterminous with the Middle East, uh, which describes the geographical position in relation to Western Europe, rather than, looking, than its location within Asia. And due to its perceived Eurocentrism, a uh, number of international organizations such as, the, such as the United Nations have replaced Middle East with West Asia. However, in the preferred term continues to be the Middle East. Uh, when we talk about West Asia, we broadly refer to those countries that are members of the League of Arab States, uh, Israel and the non-Arab countries of Turkey and Iran. And these countries are basically clustered into three sub-regions. Uh, the region of North Africa, the area along the eastern past of, uh, part of the Mediterranean, that's the Levant of the colonial times, as well as you know the oil producing countries of the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula. Now there have been very various debates questioning the very logic behind the clustering of countries which are as varied historically and culturally as Iran, Turkey, Israel, Somalia, Yemen and Tunisia under a single category, either Middle East or West Asia. They were uh, arisen from time to time. You know, yet when we talk about this grouping, what we try to emphasize is the underlying principle being as the category of nations do share historical experiences uh, in the spread of Islam, the reach of the Ottoman Empire, and their experiences of European colonialism. So the point here is not to settle on a better or a more accurate category, but to recognize the myriad ways in which the region coheres as a whole around some issues, less so around others. A uh, contemporary West Asia as we see it today is typically portrayed as a region of intrigue and war, a uh, sort of cradle of terrorism and religious extremism, Journalists more often than not report stories of conflict and dispute, abuse of power and privilege accompanied by you know, anxious calls for reform and political change. Uh, but then you know, there are others who contend that West Asia is just like any other developing region. From their perspective, this region, like any other region, suffers from the effects of modernization, lack of political participation, slow economic growth and foreign indebtedness to the West, competition for arms and increasing urbanization. Uh, in recent times, the growing interest in the region has been accompanied by an interesting number of academic journals, texts and books devoted to the study of the area. Uh, in Asia particularly, in China and Singapore, as well as in India, we now have specialized academic centers on West Asian and Middle Eastern studies, besides academic programs in the countries of the region itself. Uh, in India, the West Asia program began uh, in the Jawaharlal Nehru University and uh, in the 1950s and 60s, and around the same time in Jamia Millia Islamia in New Delhi as well. As far as the Maulana Azad Institute is concerned, the West Asia program actually modeled itself upon uh, the more prominent and established program of the period, which was the Central Asian or the Eurasian program, which Anita talked about in great details. Now, in the sense of a structured annual forum, you know, for discussing and debating the expanse which can be categorized as West Asia, uh, took shape in the Maulana Abul Kalam Azad Institute of Asian Studies in December 2009, where for the first time we organized a seminar which centered around the theme Understanding Israel Palestine, Understanding the Israel Palestine Question Resonances in the Politics of West Asia. 
Now, what the seminar intended to do was to handle questions thrown up by new directions of scholarship in Israel, uh, highlighting the evolution of the state as a political unit as well as a demographic space. And elsewhere, in order to make sense of what is arguably one of the most volatile regions in the world. Uh, then again in 2011, we went a step ahead and moved out of the Israel-Palestine boundaries and looked at the entire region in the form of a seminar called Perspectives on West Asia, its evolution as an area of study in the changing geopolitical discourses. Now the primary uh, aim of the conference was to look at the construction of the space called West Asia in contemporary times, look at the security issues which involve the space, where it is intermittently viewed in terms of security roles and problems, and looking for alternative perceptions of the region. Now, in keeping with uh, the momentous developments that have taken place in the region, uh, the next annual West Asia seminar was convened in 2012, and it focused on the theme, Interpreting the Arab Spring, the Significance of the New Arab Awakening. Now, the underlying principle in organizing this seminar was to broadly examine the challenges posed by the movements of the Arab Spring in the realm of policy making in the region. It also intended to look into the perilous nature of the changes as it unfolded, as well as provide perspective on the shifting landscape of a turbulent region and establish the implications of the turmoil both in the regional and global sense. Uh, keeping abreast with the times as a follow-up to the previous seminar, uh, we thought of organizing another seminar this year, uh, which is called Rethinking West Asia, Moving Beyond the Revolutions. This seminar in turn explored and assessed a number of significant issues that have been identified and remain crucial to an understanding of the region in the context of the continuing developments arising out of the recent revolutions in the Arab world with the intention of initiating a debate on major questions regarding how to frame the unit of analysis in the Middle East or West Asia as compared to say or Arab politics or the Islamic world. This seminar reflected upon the significance of constructing current events through the framework of a revolution and debated on whether any particular set of events is really a revolution or not. So when we look at how we've structured the West Asia program, the primary objective of it has been to explore, as I said earlier, the territorial conceptions pertaining to the region. That is to say, perceptions of the region in a geographical, political, cultural, and economic sense. Inquiring into the complex web of relationships of influence and control, gaps and continuities that characterize the region fall well within the program's purview. It seeks to attain an informed understanding and analysis of the political, social, and economic approach, approaches, processes, and movements for democracy and development within the region. It aims at exploring in, intra-regionalism through empirical and theoretical perspectives in the West Asian context, reconnoitering the ruptures, fault lines, and analyzing the politics of conflict and cooperation. It further intends to understand and interpret the politics of resistance in the region with an emphasis on the Israel-Palestine question, but not treating it as the only issue or the core issue, looking beyond that as well. In addition, it has also tried to highlight the relationship with, uh, between the external powers, external power centers like the United States and West Asia, the European Union and West Asia. Uh, it also focuses on an inquiry into, into the post-World War American initiatives and policies, economic, political, diplomatic, and uh, military policies towards the region, as well as the attitude of the region towards the United States. It also aims at examining the increased role of the other established power centers of the world, as well as the emerging ones. And it certainly intends to put an emphasis on the relationship that India has had historically, particularly in the cultural sense, with West Asia, concentrating, as I said, on its historical links with the region and her interests in the region, the contours and dilemmas of her policy towards West Asia and, change, and the changing perspectives in an era of globalization. Uh, in terms of uh, the structure of the program, 
by way of organizing seminars and symposiums generally, and by supporting individual academic endeavors explicitly, the Institute has tried to comprehend the contemporary construction of the geographical expanse and the categorizes West Asia. And as I said, the West Asia program has evolved over a period of time, focusing on various issues, looking beyond the Israel-Palestine question, looking into the larger West Asian space, inquiring into regional and global perspectives, and underlying the complex and deep-rooted links between India and West Asia. Uh, the program also uh, believes in collaborations. Uh, we worked with and are uh, looking at collaborations with the uh, universities and institutes from the region, uh, some of which, which are uh, in the process our collaborations with the American University in Cairo and the Cairo University, as well as the Partners in Development Program in Cairo, the Moshe Dayan Center at the Tel Aviv University. Uh, we also look forward to collaborations in Turkey. And uh, other than this, the Institute has also, in the past, as well as today, continues to support projects on various aspects of the Arab-Israeli conflict on Israeli society and politics, on comparative ethnic relations in the region, on the politics of sectarianism, nationalism, and post-nationalism, and comparative politics and democracy in West Asia. In addition, there have been individual projects on Israel and Iran, and currently uh, there is uh, research going on related to, I'm personally working on what I call the rhetoric of the Arab Spring, and we have uh, some young research assistants who are also working on new social movements in the region. Uh, this is all that I have to offer in terms of the West Asia program in the Maulana Azad Institute. And as my colleague Anita has said before me, we would be very happy to have some of you in our institute as part of workshops, as, you know, as uh, research assistants, and as the way, as we move forward. Thank you. Asya Çalışmaları Enstitüsü'nde 
yıl birkaç yılda bir, e, de, e, birkaç yılda bir olmak üzere değişik seminerler, konferanslar düzenleniyor. Mesela 2009 yılında ilk olarak düzenledikleri seminerde İsrail Palestina Filistin sorunlarını anlamak üzerinden çıkmışlar ve bu sorunun çözümünü anlamaya yönelik bir seminer düzenlemişler. 2011 yılında ise İsrail Filistin e, olayında biraz daha genişleyerek genel anlamda Körfez oradaki perspektiflere bakmışlar. Körfez bölgesine 2012 yılında Arap Baharını yeniden yorumlamak ya da yorumlamak diye burada siyaset ve e, siyasetin oluşumu bölge ve dünya açısından önemli değinmişler. 2014 yılında daha birkaç e, gün önce Yine bir konferans düzenlediler ve orada Batı Asya'yı yeniden düşünmek, Arap dünyasında yakın zamanda meydana gelen ilişkileri gerçek altına almışlar. Böylece genel olarak özellikle son zamanlarda meydana gelen gelişmeleri yakından bakıyorlar. Onların coğrafi, jeopolitik, sosyal, ekonomik, siyasi sorunlarına gerçek tutuyorlar. Bölgenin resmini, durumunu, sorunlarını masaya yatırmak üzere çalışıyorlar. Ee, ve teorik olarak bunu bir teoriye e, uygulamak, ondan sonra ayrıca direniş konusu, direniş meselesi çalışıyorlar. Bu eski nasıl, bu faktör nasıl diye. Ee, bununla beraber ABD'nin bölgeye yönelik askeri siyasetine yönelik çalışmaları bulunmaktadır. Hindistan e, bu bölgeyle tarihi olarak bağ bulunmaktadır. Onun için değişik sempozyumlar, seminerler, Akademik çalışmalar, toplantılar düzenleyerek bölgedeki meydana gelen gelişmeleri yakından anlamaya çalışıyorlar. Ve bu olay sadece İsrail, Filistin sorunundan öte genel bölge, genel dünya anlamında da önemli bir soru. Hindistan'ın bölgeyle ilişkilerini eskiden beri süre gelen ilişkilerine dayanmaktadır. Ayrıca Batı Asya ya da Orta Doğu'daki o bölgede üniversitelerle ve değişik kurumlarla da işbirliğine bulunmaktadırlar. Mesela Kahire'deki Amerikan Üniversitesi, Moşudayan Üniversitesi ve Türkiye'deki değişik üniversitelerin bu bölgelere yönelik çalışan, araştırma yapan merkezleriyle de işbirliğinde bulunmaktadır. Özellikle milliyetçilik, post milliyetçilik gibi kavramlar teoriler üzerine çalışmakta. Kendisi bizzat Arap Baharı'nın retorikleri konusunda çalışmaktadır. Enstitüleri değişik konferanslar düzenlemektedir. Sizlere de daha önce diğer arkadaşımız söylediği gibi hepinizi bu konferansta görmek isteriz dedi.
study different cultures and languages and develop his ideas of life and notions of politics. To mark his birth centenary in 1989, the Maulana Abul Kalam Azad Institute of Asian Studies was conceived to help nurture his faith in the nation's composite culture, world peace and progress. The foundation stone of the institute was unveiled on 12 March 1993. The Maulana Azad Museum was inaugurated on 11th November 2006 at his Kolkata residence in Ashraf Mistri Lane, from where he carried out most of his political activities. He moved from one corner of Calcutta to the other, as if he was trying to build up and mobilize people. It was around 1932 that Azad had come to this house and he had made this into his home. And this was the area for which Azad was also taking up the cause of the working class. It was from Calcutta that Azad was basically getting this inspiration. With the joint efforts of the Ministry of Culture and the Maulana Abul Kalam Azad Institute of Asian Studies, some of his personal memorabilia have been carefully preserved. A rare treat not only for scholars and researchers, but to a large section of people who like to delve deep into the history of our forefathers.
necessary to know him. He should be discovered not only in his speeches and the work that he has done, but in those small little things that bear testimony to the life he lived.
Every year on this day, Maulana Azad Institute of Asian Studies holds a Maulana Azad Memorial Lecture given by an eminent Indian personality. Maulana said, We must not for a moment forget it is a birthright of every individual to receive at least the basic education without which he cannot fully discharge his duties as a citizen. There is a dire need to invest a collective faith in his perception of spiritual freedom, a freedom that is the result of the Creator's infinite and eternal love. Therein might dwell the answer to the quest for a society devoid of any discrimination. Turkish is 
So in terms of language studies, in terms of uh, you know, the country per se, and uh, the Ottoman period has you know, always been uh, you know, a period of great interest for Indian academics. So in terms of the academia, there's been tremendous interest in Turkey, both as you know, in terms of its uh, history that it's had, and also in the contemporary context, uh, keeping in mind it's very, very important you, uh, you know, a geopolitical location. It's always been very important. Historically, India's linkages with Turkey have been very strong. And even during our uh, freedom movement, I mean, Azad was one of the staunchest supporters of the Khilafat and there have been uh, uh, you know, representatives from your country coming to us seeking support for the movement. So historically that has already uh, always been there. I think in more recent times there is again resurgence of interest in certain cases. I think it is uh, reflected not so much in governmental policies as at the track to level and also in the academia. I mean, this week we are here. Next week in the Jawaharlal Nehru University, there is a joint uh, meeting uh, on India and uh, Turkey, which is being uh, organized jointly by the Jawaharlal Nehru University and uh, a research institute uh, from Turkey. So these endeavors actually show that you know if you are looking at uh, india turkish relations, and that looks at it both from an historical as well as a contemporary uh, perspective, there is uh, a certain amount of interest. And of course, among the people, uh, there is always interest. It's not that uh, we are hoping to work on that further and take it uh, forward. So,
Really, it's an honor to so come for us for our center. Thank, Thank you very much.